we're now live. Right. Welcome everyone who's uh, who's signing in for this webinar today. It's always fun to see the numbers of participants come up. So welcome everyone. Um, we're gonna kick off in just a minute, um, but while we are seeing people sign in at the top of the hour here, what we'd love to do is to bring a little energy and maybe a little bit of music into our, our Wednesdays. Um, so what I'd love to do is ask anyone who feels so inclined to just share some of the music they're listening to in the chat function. It's kind of like a desert island discs um, kind of moment. So just throw whatever kind of music you're kind of moving and grooving to right now, wherever in the world you are. I've personally been listening to a lot of Coldplay today. So I've got that song, Sky Full of Stars in my head. <laughs> Aoife, what kind of music are you listening to? Do you have any on your playlist right now? I was now? actually just typing something up in the chat and then I realized that I can unmute myself and tell you in person. <laughs> um, so I've actually been listening to a lot of music by this wonderful composer, um, Caroline Shaw. And she's got this new album called Narrow Sea. And it's really haunting um it's uh it's beautiful it combines classical music and folk music um and it's just this wonderful kind of mix of um yeah some kind of hopeful but also kind of longing um yeah just longing kind of uh, soulful music that i that i love and speaks to me oh Aoife, are are you telling me your music has a little bit of both ends to it it does char all my music has a little bit of both ends yeah Amazing. How about you? I love, I love it when you have these playlists and you have sort of very different forms of music, but they all kind of come together and kind of create an overall overall vibe for the day. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking. I'm, I'm not seeing any. I'm not seeing any of our participants put their music. Oh, Charles. Thank oh, you. you too. Beautiful day. Beautiful mm -hmm. day. That's actually going to be on my playlist later on this afternoon. Although I have to admit, it's still it's it's overcast here in London, but I guess it doesn't have to be sunny to be a beautiful day. Um, mm -hmm. Nice. Oh, cool. Power down playlist. Oh, I'm going to tune into that one too. Thanks, Madeline. Teresa, can you I, I have to say, I don't know this one, but again, this is, this is so great. We're just going to have a, a, a playlist for our, our session by the end of today. So encourage okay. everyone who's, who's there. Miles Davis. Good job. Um, keep on putting some songs in. We're going to come to you quite early in, in this session to get your thoughts. So let's just get going with that chat and feel free. Any music you might have in the background, Keep on putting it in. Oh, piano music. Great. Thank you. All right. Over to you, Brad. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sean Aoife. So thank you. Thank you very much for joining us for, for today's webinar. Uh, we really appreciate you giving up an hour of your, of your time. Uh, today's webinar um, is focused on the climate emergency, um, specifically with the power of both and in addressing the climate emergency, which Shah um, and Aoife will go into in a bit. So just to introduce uh, both Shah Love and Aoife Brophy. Um, Shah is uh, a global change maker. Um, she's contributed significantly over time uh, across a number of, of very important initiatives at the school. Um, she is co-founder and activist in residence at B-Lab UK. Um, she is our program director of our new climate emergency program in partnership with both the business school and the Smith School. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail towards uh, the end of today's session. Um, and both Shah and Aoife do some very insp inspirational work across uh, climate the environment, but also um, leading our regenerative and circular economy lab uh, within the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship at the school. Um, so Aoife, um, Aoife, I would say both the Smith School and the Business School are very lucky to have her. She is a joint and dual appointment um, at both institutions. Um, she's a departmental research lecturer in innovation and enterprise and her research focus specifically looks at understanding um, what the systematic environmental challenges uh, pertaining to the climate crisis are 
and uh, associated systems and what these systems mean for the world of business. So thank you very much for your time. Handing over to, to, to Shaw and Eva to lead today's session. Thank you. Great. Well, listen, thank you all for, uh, for spending a little bit of time today um, exploring this mindset of both and um, and how it relates to this program, looking at the climate emergency. I think we just want to start by like recapping why we are all here, right? And, and I think we can all agree that this is a moment that really, really matters. We are facing in the world right now a series of deeply interconnected emergencies, of which climate is, is one of them. Um, and as we gallop towards COP26, which some of you will know is the sort of conference of parties meetings that the UK is hosting, um, we're going to have to really figure out ways as business, as government, as investors, as people, um, that we can aim higher, move faster, and really act together to truly address these interconnected challenges facing people and planet. So today we're here to talk about this mindset that's going to be really important in addressing these challenges. And, uh, and as we were sort of leading up to, and those of you who have kind of done a little bit of looking in advance of what sort of the work is that we're involved in, this really is about this idea of how we apply a both and mindset. Now, what does this mean actually in practice? Well, if we look traditionally in the world and actually in many places right now, we can see that a lot of the way we organize are based on these binary approaches. So for example, we got businesses that sort of focus on driving purpose, uh, driving profit on one side and then having purpose on the other. But actually we know that it's so much more powerful when these two things are interconnected and symbiotic with one another. So it's not profit, or purpose, or thinking about trade-off, it's about recognizing you can have the sort of both and. Um, another great example is in work and life. And I think in some ways, many of us have had to really get adjusted to working at home and having our life all in one place. Um, I know my kitchen table is a great emblem of both and because it is both the place where we eat and it's been the place where we've had to homeschool our kids. So, so really recognizing that both and is around us all over the place. Another like little just teaser of, of sort of an example of where we see this is, is by looking at what sort of approaches we need to sort of really lean into when it comes to addressing problems. Is it about looking at how things have done in the past? Like sort of what is the old wisdom? What are the old, um, old approaches? Or is it about focusing solely on the new? Um, and actually what I think we can all agree with is it's not one or the other, it really is both and. So, so that's what we wanna really spend some time talking to you all about is how can we start thinking about this mindset of rejecting this either or, or these binary approaches and really leaning into this idea of both and. The good news is for some of you who might be thinking this sounds like mental gymnastics, it is and it's complicated, but we as humans, we are hardwired to do this and we've got proof because actually every single one of us has the capability to walk and chew gum at the same time. And if we were all in a room together, we could all sort of try that out. Maybe we do that after the webinar, but you, we, we do have these extraordinary capacities as humans to hold two contrary forces to act with these two different approaches in mind. So we're excited to get going um, and, and explore a little bit more of this with you today. And we wanna start, it's good to see we've got some music in the chat. I wanna ask a question to you as we get warmed up here, which is, are there any examples of where you can see the both and sort of happening, where you're seeing a bridges happen, whether it's between sectors or themes or areas? Can anyone come up with anything? I mean, Aoife, you, you had a great one in your chat where it's like the fusion of music, where you have different approaches to music um, in, in, in the sort of work that you're listening to. But if anyone else has some ideas uh, or examples of where they're seeing, again, this both and approach, um, we'd love to see it. And, uh, and what we'll do through the course of our conversation today is share a few things that will be coming out in the climate emergency program. Um, but Aoife, do you wanna kick us off with some of the things that you are excited about when it comes to both and thinking? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Shar. Um, so I thought um, a really nice place to start with the both and is actually thinking about the program itself, right? And it's really the Climate Emergency Program is this unique partnership between um, the Business School and the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment. And um, I, I think the partnership itself represents a bit of a, a both and. Um, we're interested in um, climate and business in this, um, in this program. We're interested in the intersection between business and other actors um, that all need to work together um, to be able to enable change, 
Um, so there's lots of different intersections, lots of lots of different boundaries that we're interested in crossing um, as, as part of the program. And that really is represented in um, the two um, departments um, coming together to, um, to, um, to develop um, the program in partnership. Um, I think it's also, um, we, we actually had a lot of different titles for the program as we were developing um, our ideas about what we wanted to, um, um, how we wanted to position um, the, uh, the climate emergency program. We first emphasized um, business first and, and then climate. And then we realized that actually that doesn't really do justice to the both and approach that we felt was um, very important to have um, come through the, the DNA for the program. So that's why we've called it the climate emergency program. And um, that's our way of um, bridging actually um, and focusing to start with on the global challenge that we have um, of the climate emergency and then harnessing the role of business in addressing that emergency. And I think that can be a very important tool having this um, overarching global challenge that unites us in some way. Um, and that's really central to the partnership between the business school and the Smith School. So we really have two sides to this. Um, on the one hand, we're bringing the power from the business school um, and the role of business and practice into conversations about climate. And we're really seeing more and more emphasis on, on ways to do this um, in practice in, in the run up to, to COP26. The business school really is very well positioned to do this because we have such a, a focus on world scale challenges um, as, as Said Business School and the fact that we're embedded in, in the wider university. That's a really important part of, um, of the, um, the, what the business school brings. And then the Smith School, on the other hand, brings this range of deep expertise from around the university focused on the science, on the economics and the policy of climate. So we can go deep into um, many of these different dimensions of, of the climate emergency. Um, and we are unified in this, in this focus on um, the world scale challenge, the climate emergency, um, the recognition that yes, um, the role of business is, is critical in enabling action um, at the scale and the speed that is required. Um, and um, really bringing and harnessing um, the power of many different actors to, to be able to do that. Um, and I think this, the program itself um, is an example of wider initiatives in the university to connect um, climate and business um, and climate and practice, science and practice, and these intersections between um, so many different disciplines that are required um, and between um, academics and practitioners. Um, so Oxford Net Zero is, um, is a wider initiative um, in Oxford, in the university, um, an interdisciplinary research initiative that um, was launched um, late last year um, that we are also connecting with um, in developing um, the Oxford Climate Emergency Program. Um, and the purpose of this initiative is to, um, to bring many different departments um, in the university together, um, unifying our approach to engaging with governments, with businesses, and with international organizations to, um, to support many of the, the net zero initiatives that we, um, that we are seeing emerging in this, um, in this run up to, um, to COP26. Um, so I think that's kind of the first um, both and is really kind of thinking about how that's embedded in, in the program itself and how we've um, done that by focusing very much on um, the climate emergency as a, as a starting point. Um, I think the, the second kind of both and that I'd love to highlight is um, this combination of individual and collective action. So we're seeing lots um, of momentum around different types of initiatives that really try to bring this um, focus on individual action and collective action together in the run up to, to COP26 and in this, in this year of, of focus on climate. We know that there's lots of work that needs to happen um, in every organization to, to measure um, carbon and other, other greenhouse gas emissions, for example, to set um, different um, targets for, um, for net zero. But unless we're doing this in a way that aligns with national, with regional and with global targets um, and with the latest research, there's, there's very little chance that we're actually going to collectively um, reach the goals that we need to. Um, and, and I think there's a really good example um, of this kind of connection between individual and collective action in the Race to Zero campaign, which I think is a fantastic example um, of this, this push. It's basically a coalition of net zero initiatives, including cities, 
um, regions, businesses, investors, universities, setting out minimum requirements to be to be part of this campaign and racing to get to, to net zero um, emissions. Um, building on a lot of existing and in individual efforts from organizations and other um, smaller coalitions, but then using this momentum in bringing so many actors together to raise the bar on leadership um, on, on net zero and on climate action. And I think it's a really good example of um, the, the importance of having um, a big coalition, but also then smaller coalitions and lots of action distributed through um, many different types of organizations in different ways. And I think we still have a lot of work to do in understanding how to track um, individual progress and how that connects with um, collective um, progress. And um, these are things that Char and I are both involved in, um, in a research capacity and in a practice um, capacity. And we're really interested in using this program as a way to help us build on the momentum and keep momentum going um, and make sure that, that many of the organizations involved in these bigger initiatives are learning from each other in ways that are actually implemented in um, practice. So there are lots of organizations, individual organizations at the forefront of these bigger collective efforts um, like Race to Zero, including many um, B Corps. Um, but I think there's also really a need for us to understand how to share these best practices with, um, with others um, and how to make sure that um, the organizations that are not un involved in, in Race to Zero, for example, are um, benefiting and, um, and learning in ways that can um, that benefit their own organizations and um, the collective as a whole. So I think this individual and collective is absolutely fundamental to, um, to our program and, and to addressing the climate emergency um, more broadly. So those are my kind of two to get us started, Char. Amazing. And I think we have a couple more that we can share, um, but I also want to just draw people's attention to the chat um, because we've actually had Sarah provide a great example, um, Divine Chocolate, which is a fabulous example of um, profit and purpose. So the both and of being a for-profit business and um, very clearly recognizing the important impact um, the company can have on the stakeholders um, that are part of the of the overall value chain. Um, and, and I will just say, you know, if I'm really agreeing 100% with you on this idea of collaboration to help us all find ways to go further, faster together, and that it's so important. The scale and the size of the challenges we're facing really do require um, a collective force working together so that we can learn from each other, share our practices, understand what experiments work, which ones don't, in order for us to move, move again very, very quickly and, and be willing to take some of those big, bold risks that we know are gonna be needed in order to meet sort of some of the ambition um, that we know we have to get to when it comes to addressing the climate emergency. So, so here I wanna share um, and go a little bit deeper into Sarah, the example you, you sort of proposed here. Um, which actually comes down to a question about business models. So the both and I'm going to throw out here for us to sort of think about and, and riff on a little bit is, is about this idea of a business model that is both delivering a return to its shareholders and um, you know, having a wider impact on stakeholders. Again, creating sort of positive externalities and using the power of that business to actually solve some of the problems that are, are we know we're facing. Um, so again, Divine is a great example. And, and if I'm so happy you mentioned the B Corp movement, because obviously that's a place where I spent a lot of time. And it's great because actually within that movement, there are a range of sort of clear examples and, and, and really evidence um, about how this is possible. Um, but let me just take a quick step back as we go a little bit deeper into this both and of almost what businesses do and who they deliver returns for. Um, again, what they do is to create a return to a shareholder and to a stakeholder. Um, you know, because I think traditionally we have seen businesses focusing on one or the other. Like, you know, here's here's our sh our shareholder. We need to maximize a return for them and, and give them as much profit. And then maybe if we have some money left over, we can do some things about contributing to the environment. And I think that is the binary that we we feel really strongly needs to be rejected. And actually, again, it's about um, creating products and services that are about solving some of the challenges that are facing our planet. Um, while also being a profitable business and doing it. In other words, really harnessing, you know, what the engine of business is um, to address these challenges. 
Um, so I think this really does come down to what the business model involves. In other words, what your business is in the business of doing. Um, and again, one of the things we've spent some time with in, in developing this program is really looking at where are some of the examples of companies that are really kind of leading in this both and approach to their business models. Um, we've got some great examples. Um, Patagonia is one that's sort of near and dear to my heart. I actually usually have my Patagonia vest on. Um, but I think Patagonia is great because as some of you may know, they're experimenting with, um, for example, worn wear, which is a platform which allows them to repair and resell clothing in order to keep it um, in use, the utilization of those products as long as possible without it going to landfill. So again, it's a, it's a, a profitable line and it's creating um, a way to solve some of the problems we know exists in the fashion industry. Um, I'm also really interested to see that Patagonia is really getting into food. Um, so some of you may associate Patagonia with you know, outdoor gear, uh, but actually recently they've started to get into regenerative agriculture and working in partnership to your point, Aoife, about collaboration being key um, with sort of regenerative experts around understanding how we could create um, it, regenerative um, and, and organic foods. So I encourage people to check some of that out if, if it's of interest. Um, and I should also mention, this is sort of some of the stuff we're also tracking um, in the regenerative and circular economy lab, um, which Brad mentioned very kindly in his introductory remarks. It really is a joint partnership between uh, the business school and the Smith School, again, recognizing the first both and that you brought up, um, IFA, which is where, again, business and um, research really comes together strongly. So I think those are just, just another sort of picking up on what you've shared, Sarah, and, and riffing on it a little bit, this idea of, of business model innovation being a really clear place for, for both and action. Great. Um, and I'd like to kind of pick up a little bit on that because I think the business model um, concept is really helpful for us in thinking about you know, this kind of bigger purpose, the types of value that we're actually creating for different types of stakeholders, as you mentioned, Char. And I think one of the things, um, you know, obviously we're focused in the program and today on thinking about the climate emergency. Um, and there's a lot of focus on getting to net zero by 2050 globally, for example, and lots of different organizations setting net zero targets um, for on different timescales, industries setting um, these targets and, um, and regions and cities, for example. But I think one of the both ands that I'd like to kind of bring in at this point is that it's not only about the planet, right? It's also about people. And, um, and I think it's really important that we're using the power of people to help us in thinking about the positive vision for, for that future for 2050, or maybe it's um, 2100, right? That we're um, using um, this connection um, between um, what it is we, we need um, as people and living and working in our cities, for example, um, to get us to the place that, um, that is also um, net zero by 2050. And so there's lots of um, intersections, as as Shar has already um, illustrated in some of these, these these examples of interesting business models, intersections between climate and food, for example, that are really interesting to to lean into, provide lots of opportunities for innovation, um, and um, and provide us with um, this focus on on the future um, that doesn't see climate as as disconnected from um, from um, people and the impacts um, on, on our lives, um, both now and in the future. And I think we have a really big opportunity to, to, to lean into this connection and use the power of um, people to, um, to transition many of our systems um, right now, because we have governments focusing on recovery, right? We have a lot of um, work at the, at the Smith School, led by um, Cameron Hepburn and others, um, trying to understand how to, to, to actually use this moment as a way to encourage um, policies that are focused on um, areas that um, enable jobs to be created right now, um, but address um, the climate emergency in the future, um, well, both now and in the future. Um, and there's lots of opportunities for us to do that right right now. Um, so if we invest in um, green construction, if we invest in clean energy infrastructure, we can create jobs. Um, and, um, and then we also have long term benefits um, from uh, from addressing climate and building infrastructure in ways that will support um, businesses and um, and people to um, to live, um, live better, live healthier lives. Um, so I think this kind of 
intersection between um, people and planet is, is really, really critical. There's many different businesses that are trying to find ways to, to understand these intersections too. Um, and I think a particularly interesting one is the space of um, climate justice. Um, so this connection between climate action and social justice. Um, and Shar, I know you've been involved in um, the um, climate justice playbook um, for um, that it, that involves um, B Lab, COP26, and the Skull Center. I think another kind of example of a, a grand alliance um, focusing on um, this really important intersection, um, pushing businesses to think about. Um, those who are affected most by climate, actually, the impacts of climate um, and ensuring that we actually we don't recreate the same kinds of patterns that we've um, that we've actually that have brought us into this um, emergency um, that we're currently in in many different um, systems and in many different geographies. Um, so um, this intersection of climate action and social justice um, really helps to us to kind of think about, okay, we need to actually fundamentally shift our mindsets here if we're going to um, get out of the current emergency in ways that doesn't necessarily um, recreate other emergencies for us to, um, to deal with um, um, in the future. And I think that's um, very, it's a very important um, intersection, but it also brings out um, the importance of, of challenging ourselves to think about what it is um, that we're actually focused on, what kind of problems are we actually really focused on solving. And I think um, that's, you know, very much in keeping with um, this idea um, so central to the business model, what kind of value do we actually want to create and who are we creating that value for? Um, and those are and those are really um, issues um, that we that we dig into um, in a lot of detail in the program and have lots of examples of um, of ways to do this in in practice um, for um, for your organization. It's great. I'm 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 really digging the chat here as well. So please keep on throwing some great examples. Nice to see Brewdog being referenced here. And Harriet, I'm really interested in your question. Let's um, I'd, I'd love to pick this up about how we see both and working in financial services. So um, let's just flag flag that one. And uh, and and obviously, uh, Ricardo, thank you for sharing. Um, who who gives a crap? Um, <laughs> well, let's, let's have, let's have a conversation about some of this, um, when we, when we get into the Q and A. So, so keep these themes and these topics and these am examples coming in. Um, the other the last two sort of both ends, we wanted sort of seed for our, our sort of discussion, um, that we want to have with you all. It kind of builds on what you've just said here, Eva. I mean, it's about what the problem is we are solving, who we're creating value for. But there's another question, which is like where this change happens. And um, so I want to sort of think about a both and in terms of like where um, or, or organizations or sort of change um, can take place. Because I think what we have seen is sort of intuitively the sense that actually, you know, big business decisions, they happen in the boardrooms, you know, it's with all the very senior people. And it's like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> we absolutely need to be engaging in the boards, um, uh, the boardrooms of businesses. And, <laughs> and I think what we also need to recognize that there's an awakening of a range of different forms of power that exists. So, so where that change can be inspired and where it can come from actually, yes, is in the boardroom. And we can see sort of a growth of, of movements um, that are really becoming more vocal, more loud, more um, animated around these really quite critical emergencies. Um, so the power of you know people being on the street, boardrooms and, and sort of on the streets sort of protesting. Obviously the last year with the pandemic has, has created a very different set of conditions for what sort of has been a traditional approach to social movements. But, but I do think it's still a relevant, again, both and to consider. Um, I don't know about you, but many, I think people have been sort of quite um, made aware of the level of the emergency by seeing some of the work that's been, been done um, by some of the social movements. I certainly have talked to a lot of executives that are thinking very deeply about this because their children have been part of the Fridays for the Future. So there is something here about understanding, again, this intersection of, of business and, and movement, social movements. Um, and actually, I was really interested in a data point that, that recently cropped, um, uh, cut across my radar, um, which was that it, it, the, the data point was 35 and it was 3.5% of the population engaging in non-violent protest. If we look back in history, there has never been uh, a, a time when three and a half percent of the population has come out that has um, failed to drive the change that they seek. So again, there's some really interesting points if we're looking at systems change, 
what role movements can have. And this is not distinct from, you know, the important work that needs to happen in business and in the boardrooms. It's again, a complementary. And how do we again, build bridges and sort of align around what are the changes we need to see across these different sources of power? I, I suspect that that might be a little bit of a different thing that maybe um, some people who are on the line are, are used to thinking about. So I'd really welcome sort of some feedback or challenge or uh, constructive conversation around, around this particular both and. Um, the last one we want to land with you before we kind of go into sort of some Q&A is around this time frame. Um, because again, we've sort of covered a who, what, why, where, when, how, um, but this idea of when, um, and I think it's a, an important piece for us to think in sort of like a temporal way about what long-term um, requirements we are to think about what the future is going to look like and how we act short-term. So the both end of, of long and short. And actually there's a great quote by a science fiction um, author named uh, William Gibson. And he said, the future is already here it's just not evenly distributed. And that actually became a little bit of a guiding principle for us in some of the work we were doing with this program, because one of the things we wanted to really help participants understand is how they can imagine and experience and be inspired by what the future could be by kind of connecting in with sort of some of the stuff that's in like science fiction. So we have sort of an element of understanding scenarios and, and how do you use them in order to figure out ways in which you can take action today. Um, but we really challenged ourselves to think through like, how can we help people experience the future, taste it, touch it, hear it, see it? Um, because we feel like it's really important to put ourselves in a position of being able to stretch and understand how the decisions we're making today are going to be deeply impacted for the future and what the potential of that future is. Um, again, this is where kids come in. And I think this idea of you know how we can engage with the kids that are actually going to be leaders in the future, what are they imagining about what this future is going to look like? It's just for a way for us to project ourselves forward. But we also really know that action is needed now. And actually, one of the core assignments from this program really is focused on helping the participants who, who are coming to this program understand how they can take the sort of wide range of both ands that we've talked about and actually focus them into a 100 day action plan. In other words, what are the really tangible things that you can take into your business right now and get going over the next 100 days to build momentum when it comes to thinking through some of the changes we, we know are gonna be needed. That includes, again, mapping power and influence, identifying where there might be some boundaries and, and ultimately really importantly, looking at who are the different stakeholders you need to engage with, you need to bring on board and how to do that. So again, the summary on this both end is yes, this is a long-term challenge and <laughs> it needs immediate action. And, uh, and we hope to, to provide people who are, are interested in this program with ways to, to approach that. But I think that's kind of bringing us to sort of a, a good sort of half an hour of both andness. Um, I know Aoife, you've got a few thoughts to sort of just summarize um, what, what, we, uh, what we've covered and, and where we wanna go next with this conversation. Yeah, so I just wanted to wrap up by um, bringing together some of the, the skills that I think are required um, to be able to um, foster this kind of both and approach that we're talking about, right? So I think you started off, Shar, by saying, okay, this is, this is actually a lot of mental gymnastics. It can actually be very demanding to hold um, contrary forces together. And in fact, we don't always want to be doing that all the time, or it might lead us to paralysis, um, right? I mean, if we're so focused on tensions all the time, um, it can um, it can actually slow slow us down um, in in some um, instances um, and stop us from taking action. So um, in the program, we're very focused on using the both and to encourage innovative approaches um, and to draw on um, different parts of your organizations in ways that can enable action. Right. So the both and mindset um, and both and approaches are, are absolutely critical to addressing the climate emergency, but there are different ways of being able to um, develop the skills to be able to kind of hold um, contrary and um, different um, 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 forces and um, different types of actors, stakeholders together. Um, and I just like to highlight three of these um, that I think are are really critical to um, to the program and to to addressing um, the climate emergency more generally. The first is something that I think we've um, talked about in probably all of the the both ends um, that that have come up today. The first is collaboration. 
Um, so I think one of the key ways of being able to um, enable action um, when there are so many tensions is by leaning on others and using the skills of, of different organizations, different team members in ways um, that can address um, the multiplicity of issues and intersections that are required to, to address the, the climate emergency um, in, in, at, at timescales that, um, that are really required. Um, and so this, the, the collaboration and the spirit of collaboration is very much integrated throughout um, the, um, the, the program and throughout much of the work, um, in fact, that, um, that Shara and I both do. We're both in these positions where we bridge across um, different types of actors. Um, I'm between two departments in, the, in, in a university, between different um, disciplines, and it's those spaces in between that we, um, that we really need to develop and to, um, to reconsider as we're um, as we're addressing such a, a complex um, challenge. The second skill um, that's very deeply embedded in the work we do and in the program itself is systems thinking. Um, so we um, are very much um, committed to starting with a focus on climate, um, as I said at the very beginning. And this is a complex global challenge and we're not going to be able to address it or understand it if we, um, if we think in silos or if we think in very linear ways um, because there are so many different intersections um, between um, different um, challenges, um, like we've already il illustrated, different problems connected to climate, like social justice, um, but also connections between different um, actors in industries, across industries. And so the skills required for, um, for systems thinking um, include, for example, being very comfortable with seeing those connections and being able to map those connections in different ways that can um, change your perspective, um, reframe problems so that you can see um, new opportunities um, from, um, from diff creating different types of value, for example, for, um, for your organization. Um, but there are lots of challenges that come along with um, developing those skills, right? We need to be able to kind of think broadly and narrowly um, and know when to do that at the right times as well. And I think that's um, um, very much integrated throughout um, the, um, the modules in, in the program. And then the final thing, and this comes back to um, how you finished, um, Shar, I think time is just absolutely critical in any conversation about um, the climate emergency. We need to be able to develop skills to focus on today and on the future and quite a long-term future. Um, and one of the things that we really wanted to build into the program is this focus on an action plan. So it's not just something that happens at the end. Um, it's an integrated um, part of the, um, the experience um, for the program. And um, we want this to be um, to enable action right now, but also to enable and support um, action for, um, for the long term and developing the skills to be able to do that um, and to be able to approach this immediate and um, long term um, action in different ways um, is, is, is the third kind of main skill I think that we and um, that we all require whatever kind of organization we're, um, we're working in and being able to address um, a, a challenge as complex as the climate emergency. Right, so I'm going to stop there because I think we're, yeah, we've definitely talked enough um, and we could keep talking about both and approaches and Shar and I, this is, yeah, something we could keep riffing on. So I think um, it's time for some questions. Yeah, and, and the good news is if we've got some great um, reflections and questions that are already coming in here. So um, I want to actually pick up on, on on Simon. And actually, Simon, if I'm not mistaken, I feel like you and I sat next to each other at an event back when we could actually be in the same room for events. Um, I might be mistaken, and maybe it's a different Simon Gage, but um, but I, I, I do remember. I think we, we, we did connect on it. And you've asked a really important question here around the difference between this course and another one that some of you might know that's being offered by the business school. Um, and, and I think the framing of it is um, leading sustainable corporations. I, I think that might be one that you're referring to, Simon, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Brad because um, Brad is sort of uh, at the business school and across the sort of range of portfolio of programs that are offered. So you know, Brad, are you able to come off mute and, and maybe just reflect on what you see um, being the main differences between this course and leading in sustainable corporations? I'm Sean. Thanks, Simon, for, for, for a very good and thoughtful question. Um, we do get asked this question a lot, so it, 
you know, I'm glad we've got an opportunity to, to clarify that here today. Um, so when we designed uh, leading sustainable corporations, we designed it as a very overarching um, broad program that addresses a number of, I guess, fundamental areas of, of research um, at both the school and the broader university. So, you know, we look at things like what does corporate purpose and value creation mean um, at a very high level? Uh, and what does that mean to those that are looking at measuring and reporting on, you know, very purposeful and fundamental areas around the environment, uh, society and government? So what does ESG factors look like for an organization? Uh, and how does that filter through all the way through to triple bottom line reporting? Um, how do you report that to your shareholders, your stakeholders, um, and your investors? Um, so there are elements that look at climate change. So one of the modules um, talks about responding to, to climate change, but it, it touches on a number of different areas that both the, the, the business school and the Smith School specialise in. So we touch on things like the circular economy, the circular and regenerative economy. We look at things like um, Kate Raworth's donut economics model, which likewise in, in, in this programme, but we also look at some of the levers of change. So I would say the main differences, and they are complementary, is where's leading sustainable corporations is meant to give you the 360 degree birds our view of what sustainability means in the context of finance, of governance, of risk management, of reporting. Um, our climate emergency program goes very deep into and is solely focused on what do we need today to do now to ensure we have a planet in the future. Um, and there's some very fundament fundamental areas that we cover. So, you know, Shaw and Aoife have thoughtfully looked at what, what does it mean to create a 100-day business plan or plan for your organization that enables you to mobilize and influence change? So how do you go about influencing change throughout your organization to bring about meaningful results for, for, for climate action? Um, so that you know, that's a standout difference that we don't do uh, and we don't really touch upon um, in the same way. Um, we also look at a number of alternative economic frameworks and business model innovations. Um, so as Aoife touched on, you know, bringing in the Smith School and looking at it from a, both a science and a business point of view and what does the science, economics and policy all mean in this context so you know where's uh the the former program is very much business school led this is a collaboration and a partnership between both the business school um and the smith school um and it's integrated within the design of the program so so, so some very standout differences there but you know, we are happy to have uh, a nuanced conversation where we will explain literally the, the granular differences between the two programs, because we do appreciate from, from a high level, there seems to be a little bit of complementary overlap. Um, so yeah, please, um, I'll go into that a, a bit further and happy to schedule calls with anybody else that is interested in taking the time. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Brad. I think one thing that I'd just like to add is that um, really um, our focus in the, the climate emergency program is very much starting with a systemic um, focus. Um, and we're quite um, keen to have participants that are from many different types of organizations. Um, and that's a very important part of um, what the, the kind of work that we need to see happening in practice, engaging across a range of different organizations, learning to collaborate with different organizations, all with the focus on harnessing the, the power of business. So business is central to this, but um, we are encouraging um, participants from many different types of um, organizations to come and join us and to work together 
together towards um, creating systems change. Um, and that's a, a very big um, differentiation um, to um, and um, complementarity to the leading sustainable corporations program. I think we've, we we answered the question. We got a nice sort of thumbs up from uh, from Simon um, that I think it, he feels this is covered. But I, I, I just want to say, like, keep on asking us these kinds of questions, um, both sort of specific ones about the program, logistics we can cover as well. Um, I kind of want to make sure we're, we're not losing some of the stuff that's a little bit higher up in here in the uh, in the in the chat chain, uh, because I know we had some great examples uh, brought in of, again, these profit with purpose companies. And again, just to say, like, I think this is going to be a really interesting place to spend time with this lens that, that Aoife has shared, you know, those sort of wider system um, that needs to change that also can help enable businesses to do more when it comes to, again, being for profit. And it's an interesting question is, what is the right level of profit in the kind of context of these emergencies we're facing? So I don't necessarily, it's about maximizing um, a profit, but it, it is about recognizing the sort of interdependencies between um, how we work in business and um, the wider group of stakeholders that are, are, are part of um, the, the sort of system that we know we need to engage in. And so again, that's why it's really great. And if I'm so glad you made this point about the, the really warm invitation we have from people from a range of sectors, um, because we, we do need to make sure we're sort of putting together all the different pieces of the puzzle um, if we're gonna approach systems change meaningfully um, and, and take sort of action. Um, so again, this sort of wider stakeholder piece is, is really quite critical to all of that. Um, so thank you to those of you who have put some great examples um, in the chat. Um, Harriet, you talked about um, wanting to ask a question about how you see both and working within financial services. Um, I can ask, answer just sort of very high level and briefly, and, and Aoife, then I, I'm sure you have a lot more, more to add. I mean, I do think that we're seeing a real sort of sea change happening right now where more and more financial services companies are really recognizing the things that we're talking about today. Um, we have a whole lot of big organizations in the finance space that are making their net zero commitments. So you will see many of them as part of sort of the race to zero um, that are part of it. I'd, I'd also say within the B Corp movement, um, we have quite a few financial services um, investment funds that have actually certified as a B Corp. And again, that's because they're sort of recognizing the importance of the both and, you know, both a return um, to their to their shareholders, but also and also <laughs> creating returns that show up in the in the form of um, whether it's impact investing and, you know, recognizing there's positive externalities that can be developed through the investment in these sorts of business models. Um, uh, you know, I think there was another comment about ESG. So, so just to say that this certainly is alive in financial services and that financial services industry is going to be super important. Like they are a really critical stakeholder in the bigger and wider system we need to, no need to change. So I'm, I'm hopeful because we are seeing some really good um, stuff happening. And I think we need to sort of supercharge it and, and do a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, if I don't know, do you want to add any of your reflections on financial services as an industry? Yeah, I mean, just to to emphasize um, the the importance, particularly from this time perspective that um, that we talked about, kind of overcoming um, the the focus on on short term um, returns, um, making sure that we have this focus on the long term. And I think it's it's absolutely critical um, that um, that this particular kind of both and um, that we've highlighted. Um, is amplified um, through um, through financial services um, and, um, and and indeed has um, is being um, through many of the the different um, practices that we're um, that we're seeing um, expand um, at the moment. Um, I'm just looking at some of the chat. I'm sorry, Madeline, that um, I didn't realize we didn't realize that a lot of people were adding chat um, that isn't visible to all attendees. So very sorry to, um, about that. Um, but if you do have anything else to add, then please make sure that you choose um, all panelists and attendees um, so that, um, that everybody can see all these wonderful um, comments that are coming through. So Aoife, do you mind if I just jump in? Because I want to also pick up the question from, I, I, and I hope I'm pronouncing this properly. Is it Sa is Sash? Um, Sash, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. As someone who has a slightly um, non-common name, I, I, I hate it when I'm not able to say things properly. So just know the intent is there if uh, if I have mispronounced it. Um, you have asked a really interesting question about the risk of community interest companies and social enterprises that have sort of different models, which include, you know, donating certain profits um, to to nonprofit organizations. And are they going to be 
um, left behind. Um, and, and I, you go on to talk a little bit more about the C, the kicks, uh, the community interest companies. Um, and I think there is a piece that maybe connects to private equity, which is, um, another question that's been asked. So maybe, maybe if I take the question about the different models and kicks and social enterprises, cause it's a place we, we spend a lot of time thinking about with the B Corp movement, maybe if are you okay to pick up the private equity and venture capital, um, piece that's come, um, in this, this question, but a little bit later on as well. Um, I'll, I'll be really honest with you. I, I think um, in terms of these different models that exist, and, and for those of you who aren't familiar um, or possibly coming in from outside the UK, the community interest company is a, a legal structure that exists here in the UK um, that has sort of some very sort of specific um, components to it in terms of how an organization as a, a, as a social enterprise, um, what, it, what it does with its profits, how it, how it distributes it, and, and sort of there's a range of um, different factors that, that they take into account. Uh, I really believe that the change change that we need to see happen um, is, is like a steep mountain. Um, and and we, we got to figure out how we're going to climb this mountain. And there are going to be many, many different roads and routes to climb up that mountain. Um, and what we need to do is help people find the route that will get them there, there as fast as possible. Um, and so I actually come from a perspective that both and <laughs> like community interest companies are going to be the right model and they are going to be able to move forward with some organizations based on what the purpose and mission of those more, those organizations are. There will be other routes and there will be other um, forces at play um, on, on other journeys that others will go up on that mountain. But I think the point is that it, it, all these different roads up to addressing these significant challenges we're facing are going to be important and meaningful. And what we really need to do are, are find the right ways to collaborate. So again, coming back to one of Aoife's really Really quite key points. It's it's about how we work together, how we learn together, um, how we share what we're learning as we're climbing up this mountain, and and make sure we're we're bringing everybody along with us. Um, and hopefully by doing that, we'll get to the top a little bit faster um, than we would if we were we were going on it on our own. So I'm not sure if I've totally answered your question there, but I I, I think I just wanted to reflect on. It's not that I, I don't want, we don't want to see the different structures being left behind. I think we just need to find a way of holistically working together. Um, even though it's one of my favorite expressions is, is how do we mobilize a movement of movements? So how do we all move forward in it as a, as a collective? Um, and, and with the view that we, we can't leave anyone behind. Great, so let me just pick up on um, the second kind of part of that question. And it also connects to a question that's just come through um, in the Q and A from Christopher. Um, so I, I think it kind of builds on, Shar, your, your point about both hands. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, and I think um, there's a critical um, issue here. Um, Sash, you've actually put inverted commas around sustainable, right? There's an issue around um, definitions here that comes up also in the, in the question that, um, Christopher, you've raised about whether we should um, focus on trying to solve um, all um, social and environmental issues at the same time, or if we need to kind of be actually um, thinking about kind of different approaches to different um, types of issues. And I think um, the answer to um, the types of investment that we need and also the types of um, approaches and measurement that we need is also going to be both and, um, to be honest. Um, so I think there's a need to standardize some forms of reporting, but at the same time to make sure that we're not um, doing that in a way that it, um, it takes away from um, our efforts to um, take action on issues that are not so easy to measure. Um, so, for example, climate justice is a is a is a critical area where we still just don't know enough about ways to um, assess what businesses are doing, how they're doing it, um, and if we um, leave climate justice efforts out of our indexes on um, ESG, for example, because it's not easy to measure, um, then that's actually really very counterproductive in addressing the root causes of the systemic problems that we're trying to to address. And so I think, yes, we do need to have some um, standardization and we're seeing standardization happening. Um, and we need to have um, uh, means of measuring and, um, and reporting impact. But at the same time, we need to have um, bigger conversations about the connections between these different issues, um, the opportunities to, um, to address um, the, the synergies between them. Um, and that can be, um, at, um, at different levels as well. So one of the things that um, that we are, are very um, keen to explore with participants is making sure that um, we can make sense of um, the focus of um, 
uh, on, on on global and local efforts, depending on um, the the role that you play in um, in the system that you were part of, and that's a that's a very important. Um, um, set of skills actually that are required in uh, making sense of such um, complex interconnected um, global um, challenges um, and um, and making sense of the fact that some of these um, issues are um, much easier to um, uh, to measure to report on than others keeping up with um, developments as well um, in um, the investment community in um, um, the business community, um, in um, the the academic and um, uh, an NGO community on how we even think about these problems. Um, so um, that's a kind of quite a, a general kind of answer to the questions. I, I, th I think the connections between the questions that have been raised, um, but I think it really goes to the root of um, how we even understand um, uh, the different um, um, problems that we're um, trying to harness the power of business um, towards um, solving. Um, and I think that's um, something that many businesses and organizations um, need to be able to develop skills to, um, to develop and to change and iterate their plans over time as our understanding of these different issues and connections between issues um, um, develops as well over time. Um, and that's a, that's a big, um, part of our connection with um, with the Smith School and other parts of the university to make sure that we're bringing in um, the latest um, um, understanding of um, climate science, climate policy, um, and um, encouraging participants to, to find ways to be able to do that in their own work. Great. I, I love that, Eva, in your answer, you also brought in a whole bunch of more both ands. Um, mm -hmm. The one that struck me is, you know, the local regional and global. Um, so again, this is this is this is the vibe you're going to get from the program is just constantly sort of exploring and understanding how we stretch ourselves a bit further. Um, I think we're probably at the time where we're going to sort of wrap up and, and, and turn it over to Brad to do just sort of some final notes. Um, before we do, I think just two quick things. One is Robert, I see you. Um, and I see your your uh, your your question here and, and referencing, you know, B Corps. Um, and, and, you know, this question, I think, actually about growth. Um, what, what I would say is that in the end of your question, you talk about reducing climate impact over the next 10 years. I, I certainly think that businesses have a really important contribution and role to play in innovating, creating the ingenuity, building the networks that are needed in order to reduce the climate impact. So I, I actually feel like business has a really critical role to play at doing that. But I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying, and I hope there's ways in which we can um, engage a little bit more in some of this, especially with this idea of, of the pursuit of growth and what does that mean? Um, that's probably a much bigger conversation than what we can do in sort of just a couple of minutes. So hopefully we'll find some ways to, to continue that, that discussion. Um, but I also wanted to just leave you all with one final both and, and Aoife knows that it's one of my favorite ones when it comes to mindsets, because actually what we have covered today and what we will cover in the program is some, you know, pretty real stuff about the emergencies that we are facing. Um, and I certainly know that I'm a, I'm a positive person by nature. So I always sort of try and find, find the bright side, right? Where's the optimism? What can we mobilize around that is hopeful and positive? Um, and and, <laughs> and this is the both and. And as we do that, we really do need to make sure we are holding the urgency. We are recognizing the science. We are being grounded by it. So I, I wanna leave you, I mean, I have a whole lot of hope today from seeing the thoughtful questions that have come in, the number of you that are interested in this program, um, you know, some of the questions I know we need to keep on exploring, just the wide range of, of the both answers we've covered. So again, I, I have hope deeply um, fueling me for the rest of my day from this hour together um, and it's important to hold that hope with the context of this is an emergency. Um, so we, we hope we'll see many of you on this program or engaging in these topics, whether it's through this program or other ways um, on, on how you as an individual and you as a representative, as someone in the system um, are, are going to take action um, now as it relates to the climate emergency and figure out how we mobilize others to be a part of this extraordinary moment in history that really matters. Um, so thank you all. And uh, Brad, I think over to you for just a few closing remarks about the logistics of the program. Thanks, Shaw. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Aoife. Really appreciate um, your time today. And thank you for everybody else's time. Really appreciate it. So some final things. Um, so who we are. Um, next slide, please. Um, as Sean and Aoife touched on earlier during um, 
during today's session. Um, you know, it's the motto of, of of the business school in many respects is is solving the largest problems, global problems and challenges of our time, and that's manifested in in many different ways, specifically through this pro this program, but also our joint research with the Smith School and all the responsible business research initiatives we have at the school um, and some significant commitments across the, the broader university um, like, like net, net Zero. Um, next slide, please. Um, so recognizing that this is a partnership um, and as we touched on today, um, the Smith School brings some pretty unique um, perspectives to this discussion and our leaders globally. Um, next slide, please. This next slide just speaks to some of the fundamental and cross um, intersectional work that the Smith School does. Um, next, next slide, please. So we've covered quite a, quite a bit of our climate emergency program today. We will be um, sending a rec recording of this session to, to all participants um, and some, some further detail um, related to the program. Um, and please, if you are interested, do follow up with us. Um, we're happy to, to schedule calls and answer any questions that you, that you have related to the program. Uh, next slide, please. This gives a little bit more detail in terms of the, the, the learning journey and experience. So, you know, the program is an investment of Tom. Uh, Shah and Aoife have touched upon uh, many of the components uh, within the program. Um, we provide a very high touch uh, service and, and model. Um, so we have uh, a tutoring team and well then academic facilitation team uh, and they will work closely with all participants to ensure they understand the, the academic rigor. We also have success coaches and a global 24-7 uh, out of hours support service um, to ensure all participants work through the journey together. These programs have been designed for um, a senior audience, typically um, a global audience, and thus far um, our online portfolio reached nearly 25,000 participants from 172 countries. So on any online program, we're typically looking at at least 13 nationalities and typically covering all the major continents of the world. Um, so it is truly a global experience and you, you complete it together week by week uh, as a journey to ensure that um, the diversity in terms of what you learn from the program, but more importantly, from each other as well, um, is structured in, in a cohesive journey together. Next slide, please. Um, this, this speaks to um, benefits at both the organizational um, level, but also as, as an individual going through this. Um, some of the key benefits uh, we find is if teams or organizations um, commit to sending uh, cross-functional uh, project teams or influences across the organization. Um, it's, it's powerful to see the results of this. We've had, um, we've had participants in, in other related programs going on to co-found businesses together, social enterprises, sometimes meeting future business partners and raising capital from one another. So we've had some very material success stories in terms of our participants to come together. But it's also important to note that these aren't just disparate individual learning journeys. Organizations are able to send teams to ensure that you know, areas like the climate emergency are dealt with significantly at different layers of the organization to drive uh, proper material change. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, this speaks at a very high level, just some of the economics in terms of um, uh, the organizational partner rates we offer. Um, and we typically have three different offerings. Uh, some organizations send, send teams and they want their employees distributed to ensure that they learn from many different professionals around the globe from different sectors. Others would like uh, a premium private classroom experience whereby they have sensitive organizational uh, discussions together as, as a group while retaining the, the diversity from the rest of um, from, from the rest of the broader group. So we do enable organizations to have uh, a halved off area of the platform where they are able to link their organizational development um, to their strategic objectives, um, creating a, a quasi tailored um, experience. If, if an organization commits up to 50 participants, they will have their own dedicated tutor to guide them and contextualize their learning journey back to their, their organization, depending on their, their sector. Um, and for organizations that are interested in this program, uh, they are able to um, buy one exclusively for their organization as well. Next slide, please. Uh, these are just some of the organizations that have committed to sending uh, large teams or divisions um, onto some of our online programs. Next slide, please. I appreciate we are five minutes over. So thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate your, your time today. Thank you so much, Sean, Aoife, uh, Bryn and team for, for setting this up. And most importantly, thank you so much to everybody that's made the time to join us today um, to address a very important discussion that has uh, global repercussions for all of us and future generations. So thank you very much. Really appreciate your time and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone. Thanks for the great songs as well. We're gonna put together a playlist for the afternoon. Thanks to the great suggestions.